Today we're going to be talking about salvation. There is nothing more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation. Most of you are younger than I am, but you'll find that life is going to flee quickly, that your days are going to pass quickly, that it'll be less than a century, less than several decades, that every one of us will stand before God and be judged. And there are some who will stand before him and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. There will be others who have rejected grace all their life. They have rejected grace. And because of that, they will hear, depart from me. I never knew you. It is very clear cut in Scripture, but because of the country in which we live, filled with so much heresy, it is hard for many to discern whether or not they're truly Christian. Some take the gospel as though it were something to buy after a sales pitch, thinking that their eternal security is locked down that it is secure because one time in their life they prayed a prayer and asked Jesus to come in. There are others who walk in condemnation because they've had legalism and all sorts of self-righteousness thrown upon them so that even though they are true believers in Christ, they walk in constant doubt. Only the scriptures can give us the correct balance. Only the scriptures. How do we know that we are truly Christian when it is so easy to be deceived on one side being nonchalant about the faith on the other side reeking self-righteousness. How can we truly know that we are Christian? And that is the reason why this book was written. First John chapter five tells us these things. What are these things? The things written in this book were written to whom to those who believe in the name of the Son of God. It was written to true believers. For what purpose? That upon hearing the Word of God, the Spirit of God would apply it to their heart and they would have a biblical assurance that they were converted. Now that's John's purpose. But at the same time, I want you to see that this purpose can reverse itself upon those who think they believe and yet do not. Because John is going to give us a series of tests by which we can examine our lives to see if we are in the faith. And those who are true believers will rejoice and be made strong at what they hear in this text. Those who are unbelievers. Well, there are two possibilities. That their hearts are so hardened that they'll hear these standards, judge themselves and still have peace or their hearts will break and they will begin to see. I do not know him. I do not know him. Now, before we get to these tests, I want to go through a small introduction in this way. How do we know that we are Christian? There is one sense and we can look at this logically, but with a true logic and an honesty. The Bible promises this for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There is propositional truth here. There are statements being made and those statements are this. The one who believes in Christ has eternal life. And so there's logic. There is reason. You ask yourself, do I believe? Do I trust in Christ alone? Or am I trusting in Christ plus something? So many today claim to have a faith in Christ, and yet when I press them, press them, press them, eventually they work themselves back around to their own self-righteousness. But the true believer, well, let me say, say it this way. It would be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it would be for someone to pass into heaven with a shred of self-righteousness upon them. 
The true believer is a broken person. The true believer mourns over sin. The true believer only has hope and joy and peace because of Christ. The true believer does not delight in constant inward looks. Rejoicing in their own piety and they do not call attention to themselves, but they adopt the sayings of the psalmist who said not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thee be the glory. Amen. Will not a draw tension to themselves will not boast in their own righteousness, will not exalt their own piety, will not open up the door and say, look at me. Because your most righteous deeds are filthy rags before a holy God. And it stinks in the nostrils of God. But the true believer says, I have nothing except Christ and Christ alone. They have grown in true spiritual wisdom so that they say this. I no longer boast in the flesh. But I hope. Christ. Christ alone. I know and have seen and will see again genuine believers who struggle with doubting their salvation. I have seen that. Sometimes you hear the false teaching that if you doubt your salvation, it's because you're lost. That's not true. The reason why this book was written is because a genuine believer can come to the point of doubting their salvation. A genuine believer can doubt their salvation, but a genuine believer will never doubt. Will never doubt one truth that Christ is their only hope. That Christ is their only hope. A genuine believer may go back and forth in this. Am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved? But they will not go back and forth with. Am I righteous enough to be saved? Or am I not righteous enough to be saved? That's been settled in their heart. That's been settled in their heart. Now, verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I mentioned in the introduction that there is a sense in which we know we believe based upon reason. We know we are saved based upon reason. The promise is there and I believe it. But there is another way, and that is the witness of the spirit within our own heart. Now, primarily, that witness is the great transformation that he begins to work in us throughout the full course of our life. But there is also a subjective witness of the spirit. I know on that day that I was converted, that I was saved. I knew I was a child of God. There was an assurance. There was a peace. Yes, it was subjective, but nonetheless real. Something happened to me. It was more than just the adoption of a morality. It was more than just starting a new ethic. And it was more than just joining some religious maneuver or movement. Something happened inside me. And every true believer will have that testimony with some. It may be more dramatic than others, but nonetheless, it is a supernatural thing, the work of salvation. And if we have been converted. There'll be something of that supernatural testimony within us. It's the work of the spirit who indwells us. Now, immediately people want to say, but the heart can be deceived and you shouldn't follow emotions and all things like that. And that is true, but we still cannot eliminate the subjective from the Christian life. Something happened. The believer says, I was changed on that day. Something inexplicable happened to me. 
I was in darkness. It became light. I had no peace. I was filled with peace. I knew not the love of God and the love of God was shed abroad in my heart. So we have the idea of reason. We have the idea of the supernatural. Something occurred in us. Something changed in us. And then we have our text here. What John is basically going to do is based upon the doctrine of regeneration. You cannot understand 1 John unless you understand the doctrine of regeneration. And what is that doctrine? That salvation is more than just a human decision. That when someone is truly converted, God changes their nature. He changes their heart and he writes upon their heart his laws. That is the promise of the entire new covenant in the history of Israel. We see Israel being brought out of Egypt. And what do we see? They are given the law, tablets of stone, something external. And then we see nothing but a history of disobedience. And then we come to Jeremiah. Hundreds of years later, and God prophesies, God speaks through Jeremiah and he says this, I'm going to make a new covenant and it's going to be different. Not like the covenant I made with them when I brought them out of Egypt. No, it's not going to be, be me giving them tablets of external stone. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write my laws on their heart and they will have no need. Being taught about these things, for I myself will teach them and they will be my people and I will be their God. So. We have Paul saying in Second Corinthians, chapter five, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And here's what you need to understand. There is a direct relationship between nature and will nature and will. If the nature is evil, the will will be inclined to evil. You must understand that that is the case of every man born on this planet. He is born with a fallen nature and his inclination. The direction of his will is toward evil. What must happen? A man must be regenerated. His heart must be transformed by God. And when God gives a man a new nature, that new nature has new and righteous affections. And those new and righteous affections drive that man to the will of God, to wanting to do the will of God. And that's why John now can write that those who truly know Christ are going to live a certain way. Do you see that? There are going to be, there is going to be fruit. Matthew chapter 7. You will know them. Not just the false prophet, but you will know all by their fruit. Let me put it this way. I don't care how much scripture you know. What do you do? What do you do? The Bible does not look at what so much comes out of your mouth. What do you do? How do you live? What are you like? That is the evidence of a, of a truly converted person. I hear so many people taking Matthew chapter four. Say so when the devil comes, you've got to quote scripture at him. Jesus did not defeat the devil in those 40 days in the wilderness because he quoted scripture at the devil. That is the silliest thing I've ever heard, but it is predominant in the land, isn't it? He didn't defeat the devil by quoting scripture at the devil. He defeated the devil by obeying the scripture he quoted. Do you see that? Do you see that? This is not wizardry. This is not magic. This is faith and obedience. That's what this is. 
Now let's look at these tests. And let's start in chapter 1. Verse 5. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. God is light. Now when we hear that, primarily people begin to think, yes, God is holy. There's no blemish in Him. And that's true. But that's probably not John's principal idea here. You see, there was a group of people they can't really be called Gnostics, but at least they were the beginning of the Gnostics, a terrible, terrible cult that did great damage to Christianity in the first several centuries of Christianity and, and actually still exists today. Not only in a group called Gnostics, but it has permeated even parts of evangelicalism. They were a dangerous group and they were teaching basically this, that God is not light. God is dark in the sense that God is hidden. Esoteric, that you can't really know God, the common man, the common believer can't really know God. Only these super spiritual people could actually know God. And that in not knowing God, we also couldn't really understand the will of God or what he really requires. You see this in secular thought today, don't you? All the politicians will say they believe in God. It's just that he can't be known and he hasn't spoken. So you can say you believe in God and yet you don't have to do a thing he says. But John comes back and what does he say? No, God is light. And in this case, knowing John, knowing the gospel of John, I would say that his principal idea is God has revealed himself. God has made himself known. So look at it that way. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Verse five, if we say we have fellowship with him. So many times this passage is taught as referring to believers of whether or not believers are walking in fellowship or believers are not walking in fellowship. But that's completely outside the context of this passage. To have fellowship with God is to be a believer. To be outside of that fellowship with God is to be an unbeliever. Now, that's all there is to it. That's what John is teaching. So basically, he's saying, if we say we are Christian, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness. Now, the word walk here is peripateo from the Greek. Peri meaning around and pateo meaning to walk. It means to walk around. It is a word commonly used by John, commonly used by Paul. And it refers to a style of life in every area of life. That the Bible sees no room for dividing our existence into secular and sacred. Or there are places where we should obey God and places where God it does not pertain to God. That is not the way the Bible sees it. That all things pertain to God. And that our style of life, it is, if it is honest, if it is true, we will practice our religion in every place that we walk. So he says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, that we are believers, and yet we walk in what? That our style of life is immersed in darkness. Now, what is darkness? It's not what you think. It is more evil than you actually believe, and it is less evil than you actually believe. You think darkness would have to do with something that would have to do with Satanism or, or witchcraft or atheism. No, the idea here is this. What is light? God's revelation. What has God revealed? He has told us who he is and he has told us what he has commanded. That is light. We know we have light shed upon who is God. We have light shed upon what is God's will. The one who walks in darkness walks in a way that contradicts what God has told us about himself and contradicts what God has said about his will. That is what it means to walk in darkness. Now, I want us to look at something. 
Because we have to be very, very careful here. First of all, the word peripateo is in a present tense denoting continuous action. It's not just talking about a moment in time, but it's talking about the style of a person's life. So that if you were to simply judge a person by one moment in time, you could grossly misjudge that person. You could see a true believer commit a deed that was sin and immediately write them off as an unbeliever. But that would not be biblical. It would not be fair. It would not be correct. Or you could see a person with grotesque morality and hatred toward God. You could see them and in one moment see them do something of a righteous deed and come to the conclusion that they are believers. So you see both of those Eris tense moments, those points in time are deceiving. But what the Bible is talking about is looking at their entire style of life. How do they live over the full course of their days and over the full course of all their activities? How do they live? Do you see that? Now, here's the question for you. Do you walk in darkness? And realize this, you could walk in darkness and be very, very moral. Do you walk in a way that contradicts what God has revealed about his nature, about who he is? Do you walk in a way that contradicts what God has revealed about his will? Does your lifestyle, is it a contradiction to the will of God? Or is it in accordance with the will of God? We could set it this way if we wanted to go back to the book of Ephesians. Are you walking according to the course of this world, of this age? Are you going with the flow? Are you walking contrary to the course of this world with your eyes set upon the will of God and being conformed to the image of God? So that's the first thing that you must answer. And these tests, before we go any further, are also very important for parents because a child raised in a godly home, for the most part, will say, I believe, I believe, I believe. And if a child says, I believe, no one should ever look at that child and say, no, you don't. We shouldn't squash the fire that is within them. But also, do you do not be hasty. In your affirmation of that faith. A proper thing to do is to say, if you believe you are saved, but let us watch your life. Let us examine ourselves in the light of Scripture until you come to a full assurance of your faith based upon.